There we go. Hebrews chapter 12. I tell you, this week is going by really fast for some reason. It's going by very fast, but I've had a great time so far. I know Sunday morning, everyone knew food was cooking, so everyone was hungry, so I let you out early. Then we ate, came back at 2 o'clock. After everyone ate, everyone was sleepy, so I let you out early. Then last night after I preached, about four people told me I should have kept going. So tonight, we might be in here for a little while tonight. No, someone said, oh, no. I was preaching at one church, and um, I was telling the crowd that I was about to close. And one guy up front, he said, oh, no, brother, keep going. I ain't got nowhere to go. <laughs> and a guy in the back yelled up, I do. <laughs> but Hebrews chapter number 12, it's good to see some of my friends here tonight. We have Euclid here. He's from um, just across town there at uh, Brother Foster, Foster Covington's church and um, serving the Lord there. And um, two of my friends, um, Joy Hart and her brother Joseph Hart, I was sitting there trying to think of how long, I, how long I've known them, and I, I can't call it. I don't know how long I've known them. Do you know? I didn't think so. All right. Well, their dad is a pastor in um, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, been there, you know, how, for how long? Almost 20 years he's, he's been the pastor there. And um, he was sent out of the same church as my pastor and uh, doing a great job there in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Their mom used to be my teacher in school, and we went to school together. Me and Joe won a state championship together, so we have a lot of memories together. So it's good to see um, all of my friends here uh, this afternoon. But Hebrews chapter number 12, just going to read um, one verse here, Hebrews chapter number 12. I'm going to begin reading in verse 2. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being so good and kind to us. God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, I thank you for giving us an opportunity where we can be here in your house once again, God, and gather around your word. God, I thank you for bringing so many people here tonight in spite of the weather. God, I pray you continue to help us now tonight, God. May we leave here knowing that we've heard a word from you. Lord, in your word, you told us where two or three are gathered in your name. There you are in the midst. So, God, I pray that you reveal yourself to us in a special way, and we'll give you all the praise and honor for it. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You know, everything that we do in life, we do it for a reason. There are very few things that we do in life that we do just because. If I ask the man, why do you go to work? He may say to provide for my family, to provide for my wife. If I ask a young person, why do you go to school? They may say to get a better ed education or to get a better job or to make more money. But tonight, if I asked you, why are you a Christian? What would be the first thing that pops into your mind? If I asked you what motivates you or what drives you to live for the Lord, what drives you to serve God, what drives you to live a holy life, what would be the first thing that comes to your mind? What would be your motive for being a Christian? You know, today it's very hard to find a godly, sincere individual. In 2015. I mean, I'm talking about a person that's concerned about living holy. I'm talking about a person that's concerned about living righteous. I'm talking about a person that's more concerned about what God knows about them rather than what people think about them. It's very hard to find that person in 2015. But I believe that if we focus on the prime motive for being a Christian and if we focus on the prime motive for living for the Lord, I believe that we will be the Christians that God intended us to be. I believe that there's no greater motive for the Christian than when we look at the cross. And here in Hebrews chapter number 12, Paul said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross. You know, I don't care how long you've been saved. You may have been saved for three days. You may have been saved for 30 years, but there should never come a time in your life where you get over what Jesus Christ did for you and what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. So tonight I want to do something a little bit different tonight. And I just want you to come with me on this journey as we look at Jesus Christ on his last days leading up to the cross. First of all, first thing we're going to talk about is the purpose of the cross. What was the purpose of the cross? We all know the story. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden and God placed them in the garden and said, Adam and Eve, you can have anything in this garden you want except that one tree. You can't have that one. That one's mine. But isn't it just like us? God has given us everything we need, but we want the one thing that we can't have. And Adam and Eve, they ate of that tree, and from that moment, sin entered into the world. The Bible said in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So the purpose of the cross was for God to reunite us with God, 
to restore us into the image of, of God and to rescue us from our sins. Right. It's so amazing that when we look into, into the Old Testament, God said, let us make man in our own image. We all, we all know that that's talking directly to the Trinity. Why would God say us and our if there's no one else there? So he's saying God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when God first created mankind, he said, I want mankind to look just like me. But when God, when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit of the tree, we were turned from the image of God. So in the Old Testament now, mankind was created in the image of God. But when we get over to the New Testament, God took Jesus and he created God in the image of a man. So listen now, God created mankind in the image of God. We sin, we got away from God's image. So God creates God in the image of a man to bring us back into the image of God. Look, it doesn't get much better than that. Just to think about what God did for us to bring us back to himself. So when we look at the cross and we start talking about the pain of the cross, we start talking about how brutal the cross looks. Let's not think that God did not have a plan at all. It may look bad. It may look like things are going out of control. But at the end of the day, God had a plan for the cross from the foundations of the world. The lamb was slain, meaning that before God ever created this world in his eyes, his son, Jesus, had already died for the sins of mankind. God anticipated the needs of mankind. There was a plan in the cross, the purpose of the cross. But let's talk about the prayer before the cross, the prayer before the cross. Right now, we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's, it's so amazing to me that when we look throughout the gospel records in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over 15 times, we'll see something like this. And Jesus prayed. Wow. Just to think that the son of God is down on his knees praying. Look, if it's important for Jesus to pray, I think it's very important for us to pray as well. And the overall theme now, I want want to mention this before I get into what he prayed. The overall theme of the Bible is Jesus dying for the sins of the world. Whether you're in the Old Testament or whether you're in the New Testament, the overall theme of the Bible is Jesus dying for the sins of the world. Let me give you some examples. In Genesis chapter number four, Cain and Abel, you know the story. They were required to bring an offering to the Lord. God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. Cain gets upset and he kills his own brother. Now, that's just a thought there that Cain, he wasn't upset at Abel. He was upset at God, but he couldn't take out his frustration on God. So he took it out on Abel. You ought to be careful how you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ, because it's showing how you really would treat God if you could get to him in a physical sense. But Cain's offering was rejected because it was not a blood sacrifice. God was not showing favoritism without the shedding of blood. There is no remission for sin. So in Genesis chapter number four, this is what we see. One lamb for one man. Then we go with Exodus chapter number 12 when it's time for the Passover. And God said that he's going to send that death angel over over Egypt. And God told every man of the household to kill a lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost. And God said this, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So we go from one lamb for one man to one lamb for one household. Then we get to Leviticus chapter number 16. In Leviticus chapter number 16, the high priest, he was responsible for going into the tabernacle, and he was to offer one lamb for the whole nation. So we go from one lamb for one man to one lamb for one household to one lamb for one nation. Then guess what? Jesus comes. And Paul, I mean, John said that, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the whole world. So it wasn't just one lamb for one man. It wasn't one lamb for one household. It wasn't one lamb for one nation. When God brought his lamb, it was one lamb for the whole world. Look, it's so amazing because what Jesus did, only Jesus could do. No one else could do what Jesus could do. One lamb for the whole world. And Jesus, he did not just know that he was going to die. He knew exactly how he was going to die, and yet he still came. And now Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is what he prays. He prays to God, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Think about this now. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Wait a minute. After all of the prophesying of Jesus coming, after Isaiah went into great details in chapter number 53, talking about the death of Jesus Christ. Now it comes time for the lamb to be slain and Jesus prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, what is Jesus praying here? Is Jesus, is he avoiding the cross? Is he trying to escape from dying? No, 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 no. 
Jesus knew why he came. He came to die, and he knew that. He was not escaping the cross. Every step he took was one step closer to the cross. But I believe that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ, he is learning the will of God as a man. See, after um, Paul said in Philippians chapter number two that Jesus was made in the likeness of a man, the Bible says, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself. So we have to understand something now about Jesus. Jesus Christ, he was 100 percent God and he was 100 percent man without ceasing to be God. But when he became a man, the Bible says that he humbled himself or in other words, he limited the use of some of his heavenly attributes. So right now in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ, he's learning the will of God as a man. And get this now, oftentimes when we're sharing the gospel, we'll say something like this. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ, he died for you. And that's very true. But that is not the totality of the gospel. I want I want to show you what I'm talking about. Look at first Corinthians chapter five. First Corinthians chapter five. I'm sorry, second Corinthians chapter five. Forgive me. Remember his prayer now, father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Listen to this. Verse 21, for he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Think about that. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us. Look, Jesus was not just coming to earth just to die for sin. I want you to understand this now. Jesus, he literally became sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Habakkuk said this, that God's eyes are purer than evil and he cannot look upon iniquity. So get this now. When God took upon the sins of the world upon himself, his own father would have to turn his back on him. God, the father could not look at God, the son, because he had sin on him. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I'm willing to die for sin, but to become sin? Look, I'll die for Ed, but to become Ed? The thing that was killing him inside was that he was going to be separated from his father. I want to ask you a question tonight. When sin gets on you, what hurts you the most? You may say, oh, no, I hope my wife doesn't find out. I hope my husband doesn't find out. Oh, I hope the preacher doesn't know. When, when Jesus found out that sin was getting on him, it broke his heart that he would be separated from his father. What's your biggest fear of sin and getting on you? And Jesus now, he had to say, Father, not my will, but thine, O Lord. Jesus, the very son of God, he had to submit to the will of God. And before he could ever offer up his body physically, he had to submit his will spiritually. And a lot of Christians now, they're struggling physically and doing things for the Lord because they have not given him their will. And look, I literally believe that Jesus almost died in the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe it was hurting him so bad, praying this to God, realizing that he would be separated from his father, that he almost died. Matthew 26, verse number 38 said that Jesus was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Luke 22, verse 44, says that he was in agony. Luke 22, 22, verse 43, said the angels had to come and strengthen him. Hebrews said that the angels had to come and save him from death. While he's praying this now, Luke, being a physician, was the only one to mention in the gospel records that while he was praying that he began to sweat blood. Think about that now. The sweat, the blood comes from your, um, the sweat comes from the bloodstream. Some people believe that while Jesus was praying, his heart literally ruptured. His heart literally broke. And the angels had to come now and strengthen him from death. Now, I I want you to think about this question, and we'll get into it in just a minute. But how important was the timing of the death of Jesus Christ? How important was the timing of the death of Jesus Christ? Sunday morning, we talked about when Jesus was almost stoned. If Jesus would have been stoned to death, could he have paid the payment for sin? If Jesus would have died in the garden when he was praying, could he have paid the payment for sin? We'll get into that just a little bit later. But Jesus now in the garden, he prays, Father, not my will, but thine, O Lord. So the prayer before the cross, now we start to see the pain of the cross. 
Now, while Jesus is praying, he prayed this prayer three times. And now comes a band of soldiers into the Garden of Gethsemane. You know the story. He was betrayed by Judas. And it's so amazing that the Bible says that Judas, he sought for an opportunity of how he might betray him. You know, you never know what's inside a person's heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You never know what's inside a person's heart. And some people, they have only not done something wrong, not because they're spiritual, but because they lacked opportunity. The Bible says that Judas now, he sought for an opportunity about how he might betray Jesus. And they come into the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you look at the Garden of Gethsemane, it's kind of on a hill. And these men, they come into the Garden of Gethsemane with their torches lit to take away the light of the world. And Jesus could see them coming, but he never left. Why? Because he came to die. And in comes a band of soldiers. A band of soldiers is a tenth of a legion. At the bottom figure... A legion is 6,000 soldiers. So at least now there were 600 soldiers coming. This is so amazing to me. If you're just coming to get one man, why are you sending 600 soldiers? I think somebody knew that he was not just a man. He was the man Christ Jesus. They come in with with the band of soldiers. 600 soldiers come to take one man. Peter tries to fight. Peter pulls out a sword and tries to cut the man's head off. He missed and caught his ear. Look, think about this. Five, I mean, 600 soldiers. A ear just got cut off. Jesus picks the ear up and puts it back on his head. Look, there should have been 599 soldiers. That one soldier, he should have got saved that day. Jesus, Jesus just picked the ear up and put it back on his head. Look, you know what he's saying? There's no other way, Peter. This is all operating within the plan of God. He said, if I wanted to, I can call down 12 legions of angels. 12 legions. I just told you a legion was 6,000 soldiers. Jesus said, I could call down at the least 72,000 angels. At the most, I can call down 144,000 if we're talking about a legion. Look, in the story, there's and one soldier came and killed 85,000 Assyrian soldiers. One angel did that. One angel. If Jesus would have called down 72,000 angels, somebody would have had a bad day. But look, Jesus, he didn't do it because it was all operating within the will of God. Jesus now stands before the Sanhedrin. He stands before Pilate. Pilate says he's not in my jurisdiction. He sends him to Herod. Herod sends him back before Pilate. They both say, I find no fault in this man. And Pilate said, I wash my hands of this innocent blood. Just in Matthew chapter number 27, the high priest of Israel now, Caiaphas, looks at Jesus and says, not in prophecy, but in condemnation. He said, this man shall die for the people. Caiaphas now, the high priest. Pilate, after he condemned Jesus to death, the Bible says that he went and sat back down on the judgment seat. The soldiers now, they're mocking him and they're laughing at him because they called him the king of the Jews and they're acting like they're bowing down to him. And I couldn't help but think that one day the tables will turn. Look, one day the high priest of Israel, he'll stand before the high priest of heaven and have to give an account for what he did. One day, Jesus won't be standing before the judgment seat. Pilate, he'll be standing before the judgment seat, and he'll have to give an account for what he did. And one day, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Pilate, in truth, he did not really want to kill Jesus, but he wanted to appease the people. So Pilate now, he thought that he would just chastise Jesus or just beat Jesus just to please the people. But the crowd steady cried out, crucify him, crucify him, people that he created. They then take out the cat of nine tails. And with the cat of nine tails, this was not just your average whip. This wasn't a whip that would just hit you and then drop to the ground. At the end of the cat of nine tails, you would have bones, you have spikes, you have glass, you have nails. And when this whip hit you, this whip would hit you and stick into your body and it would have to rip it out. That's just one. These were men that were trained professionals. Thirty nine times Jesus allowed them to whip him with that cat of nine tails. Some people believe they would take you into a room with the low ceiling and hang your and hang your body to your toes were just touching off the ground. Some people believe they would lay you over a stump. They say the beating was so brutal. And I'm not trying to be cruel here, but this is what they did to Jesus. The beating was so brutal that it was not rare for a man to die at the whipping post. They, they, they give accounts of some men being ripped in half at the whipping post. And Jesus now, after being beaten, he has to take a piece of wood, put it on his back and walk uphill. They mocked him. They laughed at him. And by the way, Jesus Christ, he really was the king of the Jews. Think about this now. Jesus came from the seed of David. We talked about David on Sunday. David was a king. 
David was the king of Israel. Jesus literally was the king of the Jews. That's why Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, verse number eight, who shall declare his generations? Or in other words, if you have a man that's in your city claiming to be king, look at his lineage and see where he came from. But Jesus never opened his mouth. He never said a word because Jesus would rather be the king of your life than to be a king of a land. Jesus is now on his way to Golgotha after they after they beat him and after they whipped him. And on his way to Golgotha, he sees a group of women crying and weeping. And he looks over to his mother and says, son, he says, mother, be, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. It's so amazing here because he's speaking to his biological mother, but he doesn't call her mother. He just calls her woman. You know what he's basically saying? Look, you gave me the first birth. I'm going to give you the second birth. He didn't even acknowledge that that was his mother. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. And Jesus now, he's on his way to Golgotha. And this was not the first time that they had done this. Many men have been crucified before Jesus. And they lay the cross on the ground and put the nails into his hand. I can't imagine what these soldiers were thinking. Every other man we crucified, he was fighting us. Every other man we crucified, he was resisting. But this man, he's literally just laying down. Greater love have no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Jesus Christ, with no resistance, he lays down and he takes the nails into his hand. He takes the nails into his feet. They lift up the cross and they drop his body into the post. And I believe it was at that moment that all of Jesus' bones came out of joint. The Bible says that no bone in his body would be broken. But it did say that his bones would come out of joint. Jesus Christ at this time, he was beaten so bad that in the Old Testament, it prophesied that his bones were looking at him. They had to beat him down to his bones. They then take a crown of thorns, plait a crown of thorns, put it onto his head, make fun of him, mock him, spit upon him. And listen now, the very first words that Jesus ever said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Last Wednesday, I was talking to my teen class. And I asked them, I said, how do you think Jesus died on the cross? What was the cause of death? And of course, they said, like many of us would say, because he lost too much blood. But that wasn't the case. A, a man would die on the cross, not because he lost so much blood, but because he was hyperventilating and, and, he, and he could not breathe. So every time he wanted to take a breath, he would have to pull up on those nails and. Look, it was so rare for a man to live six hours. He was on the cross for six hours. But not just that. He was speaking while he was on the cross. Watch this now. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In the Greek, that's in the continual tense. So he kept saying it over and over and over again. When they hit him with the nail, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When they spit upon him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His first words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know the story. There's a, he's right there in the middle. There's a thief on his left. There's a thief on his, on his right. One thief is mocking him. But the other thief says, Jesus, look, when you go into your kingdom, just remember me. His next words. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Look, his first word is asking God for forgiveness. His next words is giving forgiveness. This is so amazing here because at this, at this time, these three men on this cross, the whole world is represented. One man, he's dying from his sins. One man, he's dying for sin, and the other man is dying in his sin. And while you're living, you have to make a decision of what category you're in. Will you die from your sin, or will you die in your sin? Because Jesus has already died for sin. You have to make a choice. And Jesus looked at the thief on the cross, and he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Wait a minute. His, hair, his hands are nailed. He had no time to flip through his Bible. His feet are nailed. He couldn't run to church. He's dying. He has no time to live for God. Excuse me. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say he got saved by grace through faith. Amen. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I could get to heaven on my own, why would Jesus have to go through all of this? He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Even while he's dying, he's still saving people. Think, think about this. In John chapter number one, Jesus comes to Nathaniel. Nathaniel was sitting underneath the tree and Nathaniel found out that he was the son of God. He got saved that day. Hey, hey, Zacchaeus, you come down here because I'm going to your house today. So one man gets saved underneath the tree. Another man gets saved in a tree. And then Jesus saves a man that's on a tree. Look, you know what's so amazing about Jesus? He'll meet you right where you are. 
I know men that met him when they were strung out on drugs. I know men that met him when they were alcoholics. I know people that met him when they were living a life of immorality. I know people that met him in a Christian school. Look, it's not a long distance to Jesus. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He'll meet you where you are. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Then I want you to think about this. Watch this now. I thirst. Think about that. I thirst. I always thought that Jesus was talking to the soldiers because they gave him vinegar to drink. But if if we think about it now, when was the last time we see something about drinking? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. God, if there's any other way for me not to be separated from you, let this cup pass from me. Jesus is now on the cross and he says, I thirst. I believe it was at this time that God took out his cup of indignation and poured all of our sins upon Jesus. Look, at one time, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But then Jesus cries out, I thirst. So I asked you, how important was the timing of the death of Jesus Christ? Jesus, he could not be stoned. Jesus, he could not die in a car accident. Jesus, he could not just have some random death. No, 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 no. Jesus, he could not die until our sins were imputed upon him. He could not die until he became sin. And at that moment on the cross, Jesus cries out, I thirst. And what happens after he says, I thirst? Darkness. Well, what do you mean? Thine eyes, they're purer than evil, and they cannot look upon iniquity. Father, I thirst. Jesus pours out all of his sins. God the Father turns. He cannot even look upon his son. You know how hell is often described in the New Testament? Outer darkness. Look, you know the most scary thing about hell? It's not the worms. It's not the screams. It's not the fire. It's not the burning. The most scary thing about hell is that there's no God there. And there's no chance of repentance. Darkness hits the land right after he says, I thirst. Then what does he say next? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Thine eyes are purer than evil and they cannot look upon it. He became sin for us. And the only time in the history of the Trinity was it separated when Jesus Christ became sin for you and I. <laughs> then he cries out, what, what does he say next? Father, it is finished. Look, Jesus was not saying that it is finished to his life because he's dying. I believe that he was saying it is finished to the work of salvation. Right. And in the Greek now, it was just one word, to tell us die. Look, they would, they would use this word for when the Passover lamb was coming. They took it before the high priest. He would put the lamb down and say, to tell us die. Or in other words, this lamb here, it has no blemish. It has no sin. It has no faults. It has no flaws. To tell us die is ready for Passover. It's the same word that was mentioned when a man was in prison and they would put down all the offenses that he did, all the wrong that he did. And when he had finished paying for all of his sins and all of his wrongs, they would stamp one word on there, to tell us die. Look, when the Cyclops went out on a special mission like our Delta Force or our, or our Navy SEALs, they would have a runner in the group. And the runner now, when the battle was over, and when the battle had been won, he would run back to the gates of the city and say one word, to tell us die, meaning victory and the enemy has no chance of coming back. It's the same word that a painter would use in these days when he was trying to get certain things to harmonize in his painting. He would step back and say, to tell us die, or in other words, it'll work. And Jesus now, when he's dying for the sins of mankind, he says this, to tell us die, or in other words, all of their sins is paid in full. To tell us die, just like the Passover lamb, this is perfect. To tell us die, that relationship between God and man, it will work. What Jesus did for us, no one else could do. Then he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. In Hebrews chapter, I believe it's chapter number eight. It says that the blood of Jesus Christ was offered up by the eternal spirit. Think about this now. The whole trinity is involved in the crucifixion. God the Father is sending his son. Jesus is dying, and the spirit is taking the blood back to God the Father. I'm telling you, it's so, when we start thinking about what Jesus did, it's absolutely amazing. Then the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. Look, after all of this I just said and explained the crucifixion, explained the death of Christ, you may have thought that somebody killed him. (laughs) But they did not kill Jesus. The Bible said he laid down his life. He gave up the ghost. They didn't take the life of Jesus Christ. He gave it up. 
Look, how can a man that raised someone from the dead die? <laughs> look, I, I, look, I want to I want to propose this to you. It was more difficult for Jesus to die than it was for him to live again. John chapter number one said in him was life. The only way Jesus could have died if he if he dismissed himself. He was life. I am the way, the truth and the life. You are life. How can you die? I dismissed myself. No one killed me. So we go from the purpose of the cross to the prayer before the cross to the pain in the cross. Now we're looking at the power of the cross. I'm, I'm so glad that the story does not end with pain. Jesus now is so amazing and it's so sad at the same time that he prophesied his resurrection to so many people. But none of his followers believed him. Well, none of his followers remembered. Mary Magdalene, they were going just to look at the body of Jesus Christ, but they, not were, they were not anticipating his resurrection. The only person that remembered his resurrection were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because they go, they go to Herod and they go to Pilate and they ask them to put soldiers outside of the tomb. Joseph of Ar Arimathea, a rich man now, he goes to Pilate and requests the body of Jesus Christ. And if you ever look through all of the gospel records and read them at the same time, you'll be so amazed at how much money was involved in the death of Jesus Christ. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. Judas, he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph of Arimathea, he was the one that got the body of Jesus, a wealthy man. He bought the tomb. And that's another fulfillment of prophecy because the Bible said he would be buried among the rich. And then Mary Magdalene, she, she broke open her costly oil and anointed the feet of Jesus Christ. The, the, those soldiers, they, they took bribes and they took money to say that the body of Jesus Christ was stolen. And if you look at it, the ones that gave, they were blessed. And the ones that received, they were cursed. Judas, he hung himself. Mary Magdalene, she gave. This shall be a memorial to her. Joseph Arimathea, he was the last one to handle the body of Jesus. And when those angels came down to those soldiers, the Bible says they were as dead men. It's better to give than it is to receive. That's right. And Jesus now, he's in the grave. He said, you can tell this temple down, but in three days, I'll rise it up again. Mm -hmm. And look, he cannot lie, so he would do just as he said. Amen. John, I believe it was um, John Milton. He wrote, he wrote a kind of like a dialogue between death, Satan, and corruption. That took place. This conversation took place outside of the tomb of Jesus Christ. It, it would almost it would almost go like this. Satan comes to death and Satan says, death, um, where's Jesus? And death says, oh, we got him. We got him this time, just like we got David and, and just like we got uh, Moses. Well, Elijah, he kind of got away, but we got everybody else. We got him. And then Satan says, well, um, where's corruption? Uh, Corruption, he hasn't showed up yet, but he's on his way. Day two, Satan comes back again. Hey, hey, death, is, is he still in there? Oh, oh, yeah, he's still here, Satan. We got him, we got him, we got him. We finally got him. Um, where's corruption? Uh, he's not here yet, but he's on his way. <laughs> day three comes, my favorite day. Day three comes, and before the devil could ever say anything, he hears death say, help, help, somebody come. I can't handle him anymore, and Jesus rolls up from the grave. I'm so glad that the story does not end with pain, but it ends with power. Amen. Has the power of the cross hit your life yet? Has the power of the resurrection hit your life? If Jesus did not rise from the grave, Paul said, we are yet in our sins, and his preaching is in vain. Look, it was not uh, it was very unusual for God to die, but it was not unusual for God to live. And Jesus, he rose again from the grave. You say, what should be my motive for living for God? I believe there's no greater motive than taking a look what Jesus taking a look at what Jesus Christ has done for you. You ought not ever get over that. You ought not ever get over the joy of the cross. And look, he did it just for you. Just for you, I was, I was talking to Brian about this earlier. When Jesus was on trial there, they were trying to debate between if they would release Barabbas or if they would release Jesus. And if you look at Barabbas' name, Barabbas' name literally means son of the father. We all know that Jesus was the son of the father. Right. But they released Barabbas, the son of the father, and they took the son of the father, the one that was innocent. That's exactly what Jesus, what God did for us. Exactly what God did. He, looked, he took Jesus, though he was innocent, 
and made them take the punishment as though he were guilty. And the one that were guilty, they were set free. Look, I should have been the one on the cross. I should have been the one to die. But because Jesus came, I was set free, though I was guilty. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look, I should have paid the payment for my own sin, but there's no way I could have. The only way I could pay the payment for my sin is eternity in hell. Look, my mom, she couldn't have died for me because she's a sinner just like me. My dad, he couldn't die for me because he's a sinner just like me. But Jesus now, born of a virgin with no earthly father, he came and he could die for sin because he was sinless. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number one that Jesus, he was, that Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Remember actually this question the other night? Why do we say Holy Spirit? Why don't we say Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit? Why do we just say Holy Spirit? Because it's only through the Holy Spirit can we access the holiness of God. And Mary, she had to be conceived of the Holy Spirit to produce a holy child. And that's the same thing that happens to you and I. When we get the Holy Spirit into our life, it will produce holiness. Say, oh, with the Holy Spirit, will it make me dance? Will it make me speak in tongues? Will it make me shout? Will it make me lift my legs up and go crazy in church? No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit will make you holy. Look, that's the first thing. The first thing the Holy Spirit is going to do is make you holy. The Holy Spirit of God accesses the holiness of God. And the Bible says that when Jesus, when he died on the cross, that that veil, it was ripped in twain. It was ripped from top to bottom. In Hebrews chapter number 10, the Bible says, oh, it's so amazing. The Bible says that his flesh was the veil. Think about this now. Every time they whipped him, it was tearing the veil. Every nail in his hands, it was tearing the veil. The spear in his side, it was tearing the veil. The crown of thorns, it was tearing the veil. When they ripped off his beard, it was tearing the veil. You know what it was doing? It was giving us complete access to God. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel, they looked at a sanctuary for 15 centuries that they could never go in. But when Jesus died, his flesh being the veil, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. And Jesus says, come on in with boldness. They could never go into the, into the presence of God. Now I can go into the presence of God on my lunch break. I mean, it's so mad. I can sit in my car and meet with God. I can be in my room and meet with God. Yet they looked at a sanctuary for 15 centuries that they could not go in. But when Jesus died, God says, come on in with boldness. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 10. Why do we have boldness? Because of the blood. Amen, brother. We have complete access into the presence of God. They, in the Old Testament, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 10 that they were just living for God off of a shadow of an image. Just living God up with a shadow. They didn't have the full picture. It was just a shadow. You know, they could, they could look into the tabernacle and look at the wood and say, that's the humanity of Jesus Christ. They could look at the gold and say, that's the deity of Jesus Christ, but they never saw him. But when the New Testament came, Jesus Christ, he came in the flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. Look, how in the world could they do more with the shadow than we can do with the image. They just had glimpses of it, pictures of, but now we have the full thing. And after the death of Jesus Christ, God says, come on in with boldness. Have you accessed yet the power of the cross? When we look back at what Jesus did, it's so amazing. And I tell you, that's something that just drives me. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem going out visiting visiting my teenagers, going out soul winning, waking up for church in the morning, paying my, and look, I, can, I can do that because it drives me when I look at the cross. We can look at a lot of things. We can look at society. We can look at culture. We can look at legislation. We can look at bills that's being passed. Why not just look at Jesus? Instead of looking at a bunch of other things that can discourage you, look at Jesus and be encouraged. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Just take a good look at the cross, and I promise you, you will be encouraged. Lord, I thank you for being so good and kind to us. God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, I thank you for giving us another opportunity to be here in your house. God, I want to thank you most of all for Jesus, God, and what he did for us on Calvary. God, I know for sure that no one else can do what Jesus did. So I pray that we'll give him the praise like we give no one else. May we give him the attention like we give, him, God, we give no one else, God. I pray you continue to bless and continue to help us be with Pastor Brian as he's coming, God. Bless the invitation. We give all the praise and honor for it. In your name we do pray. Amen.